Hi, I'm Fernando Pereira from UFMG in Brazil, and today we shall see how to convert a program to the static single assignment form and back to ordinary binary code. Let's start with straight line code. Straight line code is how we call a program that has no branches. It's like a single basic block. If we have a program like this, then it's relatively simple to convert it to SSA form. Would you like to think about it? You can stop the video and reason about how to convert a program without branches to SSA form. We can use this algorithm on the right. Don't worry, you can read it over if you want, just stop the video. I will explain it via examples, but the core idea is simple. We keep a counter associated with every variable name. Whenever we find an assignment, we rename the variable on the left side by appending it with its counter, and then we increment the counter. Try to apply its idea in the example on the left. Stop the video, grab a piece of paper, and do it. Here's the transformed program. Counters start at zero. So if we see a variable without definition, like x and y at label L0, then we call them x0 and y0. Whenever we have an assignment, we increment the counter and append it to the variable name. You will notice that in the algorithm we use a stack instead of a counter. We will need the stack once we adapt this algorithm to handle programs with branches. But for now, a counter, a simple counter, would do. In this case, when we have branches, we shall need some special notation to join variables. This special notation is called a phi function. Let's see through an example how phi functions are used. Consider this program on the left. We are using b at label L5. But there are two definitions of b, at L1 and at L3. When we go to SSA form, each definition gets a new name. So what, what's the name that should be used at L5? Take a look into the program on the right side and try to answer the question. The answer actually depends. It depends on which path the execution flow takes to reach L5 starting from the beginning of the program. If we reach L5 coming from L2, then B at L5 should be B0. Otherwise, it should be B1. And then we need a way to join these live ranges. This way is what we call the phi function. Phi functions work like multiplexers. They copy a variable into another depending on the program flow. So if the flow arrives at L5 coming from L4, then a phi function is like a copy of B1 into B2. Otherwise, if the flow arrives at L5 from L2, then the phi function works as a copy of B0 into B2. We can have multiple phi functions in the beginning of a basic block. In this case, they work as parallel copies. That means that the semantics of multiple phi functions is like this. First, we read all the arguments that need to be copied, and then we perform the copy. The order in which the copies happen is actually material. But of course, once we go to assembly code, we need to implement these five functions. They don't really exist in binary code, for instance. So an important question is, how do we implement them? Compilers implement five functions when they run a phase in the compilation pipeline called SSA elimination. During the SSA elimination, five functions are replaced with actual instructions. Usually, these actual instructions are copies, but that's not so simple. Sometimes we have a problem. For instance, consider this figure. Where would we implement the copy B2 equals B0? Should we place this copy at L2? What would be the problems of placing this copy at L2? In this example, if we place the copy at L2, then we are creating a redundancy in case the program flows to L3, because in this case the copy would happen again, but from B1. The problem with this program is that the edge that goes from L2 to L6 is critical. 
Do you remember what is a critical edge? We talked about them when we talked about partial redundancy elimination. A critical edge is an edge that links a node with multiple successors to a node with multiple predecessors. And if you remember, it's fairly easy to remove critical edges. We do it by creating new basic blocks in the program. In this example, we have created a new basic block on the edge that goes from L2 to L6. And without critical edges, we can simply insert copies in the program to eliminate five functions. Now, let's go back into the problem of inserting five functions in the program. Where to insert these five functions? There is a list with six properties that must be true to force insertion of a five function in the program. We shall explain these properties using this program on the right. The question is, when should we insert a five function for variable b at basic block z? First, b must be defined somewhere, say, in a basic block called x. That's our first requirement here. And it needs to have at least one more definition in the program. A variable that has only one definition will never need five functions. Can you think about why that's so? Anyways, we need to have in the program another basic block, let's call it y, that is different than x. And y must contain a definition of b as well. Then we need to have a path from x where b is defined to z. And another path from y where b is also defined to z. And these paths can only meet at z. And these two paths are the first two paths that touch z coming from x and y. So with these six properties, we can even create an algorithm to insert five functions in programs. But notice that this algorithm will have to be iterative. The things that a five function creates a definition of a variable. So if we have more definitions, then we might have to insert more five functions all over the program. So basically, while there are basic blocks x, y, and z in the program that gives us the six properties from before, we need to insert five functions in the program. And once we insert five functions, we might enable more basic blocks to satisfy these properties. There are more efficient ways to insert five functions in programs than to iterate those six properties over and over that we saw before. In the next class, we shall look into a classic approach introduced in the late 80s by Cytron et al. So there, you feel free to write me emails or with questions or comments. Thank you.